Hello, everyone. Go on ahead and make yourself comfortable. We're going to go on ahead and get started here. Thank you for joining us tonight for History Happy Hour Indie Pride. We are thrilled to be able to share the story with you tonight. My name is Bethany Rokovec, and I'm the Director of Education and Engagement at the Indiana Historical Society. It's great to see so many of your faces virtually here tonight. I'm going to go over a few logistics before passing the mic over to our speakers. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. We collect paper-based items such as books, paintings, letters, photographs, diaries, maps, and more to tell Indiana's unique stories. We then find ways to share these stories through publications, exhibits, and events such as the one you're attending tonight. Through these documents, we tell the diverse stories of Indiana and inspire, and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. Tonight, we are here for a conversation celebrating the month of pride with Indy Pride itself. We are joined by Jane Walters, the Director of Education and a board member at Indy Pride, as well as Kennedy, our Education and Engagement Specialist. Jane and Kennedy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Now, before I hand it over to Kennedy, I wanna go over just a few of our Zoom logistics for you all. For this event, Kennedy and Jane are going to talk for about 35 minutes, and then we'll open it up to your questions. If you have any questions as we go along, please drop them in the question and answer section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll keep an eye on them and then pepper them in as we get to the second half of our program tonight. If you would like to add anything to the chat box, don't forget to change your response to everyone so that we can all see your thoughts. Keep an eye on that chat throughout tonight where I'll be dropping in links and URLs throughout the conversation. But don't worry if you miss one. We're gonna deliver them all to your inbox in a follow-up email tomorrow. And in case you didn't hear the lovely Zoom voice as you entered, this program is being recorded. You can catch the replay on our website, indianahistory.org in the upcoming weeks. If you enjoy this program, I hope you'll consider coming back for more. Our history happy hours continue next month on July 20th with a look at the history of the Masons in Indiana with Michael Brumbach of the Masonic Library and Museum of Indianapolis. And then in August, we're going to be looking at the history of the written word with Tamara Hemmerlein. I hope you'll stay tuned for upcoming virtual and in-person programs. You can stay up to date at indianahistory.org. And now I will turn it over to Kennedy and Jane. Kennedy, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much for that, Bethany. All right, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, as Bethany mentioned, tonight we're going to be talking about the history of Indie Pride uh, with our special guest, Jane Walters. Um, Jane, could you do a uh, Got tongue tied, don't right out the gate. Uh, could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yes. Um... As you said, my name is Jane Walters, and I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a board member of Indy Pride and also the director of education for them. Um, I am a librarian with the Indianapolis Public Library, and I'm a branch manager of the West Indianapolis branch. And I have been a children's librarian for about eight years now, as well as now a manager. And um, I've just had a lifelong passion of creating safe spaces for the LGBTQ and for, uh, especially for kids coming into the library and things like that, creating diverse story times for them and, and that sort of thing, and just kind of making it a welcoming space. So, you know, the progression to join, you know, the board of any pride just seemed natural, you know, so I'm excited to be here. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the mission of any pride? The mission of Indy Pride um, primarily is to educate and honor our history, um, to celebrate the diversity that is all of LGBTQIA+. Um, we serve the members of the community, but we also engage with folks that aren't part of our community. That way they can learn more about us. We can educate them. We do a lot of that sort of thing, uh, going out and speaking with companies and such like that and how to embrace their employees uh, doing those sorts of things. We also do a lot of uh, phil philanthropic work um, throughout the year to support other LGBTQ uh, plus groups and organizations. 
Uh, we've got our community Thanksgiving dinner. There's award scholarships. Um, there's just all sorts of educational events. And of course, we all gather together to create and put on a massive festival and parade for everybody to enjoy, as well as all of the other events throughout June and hopefully throughout the rest of the year as well. And something that a lot of people don't realize about any pride itself is that there's only one paid position and that's our executive director everybody else is voluntary so we all have our nine to five jobs or third shift jobs and uh doing all of that as well as you know bringing our passion to make these sorts of things happen too for everybody it sounds just like it's an incredible organization um and uh, you're putting on um you're having the parade this saturday as well as the festival right Yes, we are. And it's the first time since we've, we've been in person for uh, two years now. So it's, it's nice to finally be back together. And the prospect for the weather looks really good so far. So fingers crossed it stays that way. It is Indiana after all. Uh, yeah, I've been to several of the um, uh, the parades and um, at least three of the festivals. And I remember um, at least from the ones I've gone to, it's always been like, you know, nice and sunny. Um, but everybody there's always been really excited and it's always been like a really great time. Um, uh, can you tell us what like the LGBTQIA plus uh, community was like prior to Indie Pride? We're talking about like the 1980s era. Prior to Indie Pride, um, there were pockets of the community. Um, IYG, of course, was going on, but it was also not broadly known that it was there and that it existed it was kind of one of those things where it was like you had to know somebody who knew somebody that knew about it kind of thing and so everybody sort of had to try and find their own places in other spots um there was of course like the works magazine that had that was uh queer based and i that started i believe in 1990 um and so that was a way for people to find out about like queer owned businesses, safe places, bars, things like that. Uh, a lot of times it was just trying to find those spots where we wouldn't be pushed out, that we were welcome or at least accepted, if not welcome, at least accepted and not like op that open hostility. Um, I know like for my wife, her and her friends, they hung out on the front steps of Central Library because it was safe and that was a place for them to be. They hung out in um, Broad Ripple around the Vogue and things like that. Everybody kind of had to find their own little space and, and congregate together because for a very long time, so much of it was, you know, the mentality was there was gay and straight. You know, there weren't even like all the other letters and that sort of thing. And so it's it's drastically changed over the years, which is really nice. Um, but prior to any pride itself, you did still have um, things like the Greater Indianapolis Gay Business Association, which um, in 1982, they hosted um, an, L an LGBTQ mm -hmm. event. And it was a Labor Day picnic at Westlake Park and well over 500 people attended it's so it's kind of like one of those hey here's here's early early portions of what started to kind of become pride and it was all based on lots of individual people sort of doing their thing to try and make something happen you know you had you did have IYG you had GIGBA the the greater um Indianapolis Gay Business Association. You had uh, Justice Inc. Um, there was the the Talbot Street Art Fair, which that's actually coming up soon too. I mean that these were these were little places where it was like, here's where we can kind of like make a spot for ourselves, but not be like, oh, it's pride. Oh, we're being you know that kind of thing. It, it was very, very low key in a lot of ways, just to kind of keep everybody safe. Uh, what kind of challenges was the um, queer community facing in the 1980s? Um, 
I know we talked about, you, you mentioned how um, hanging out in front of the library is a place where people gather because it was one of the safe places for them to do so. Yeah, it's, it's, there were a lot of, there was a lot of harassment by the, um, by law enforcement, raids on bars and things like that, because um, there, there were a lot of folks tended to try and find like the bars that were just known to be, they wouldn't drive you out and it was sort of kind of safe to try and pick somebody up there but it wasn't necessarily a gay bar um but the ones that were were constantly being raided um a lot of them were these very hidden you know places because you couldn't be public because there would be raids and they'd be harassed and things like that and um people were being essentially set up um to be busted for soliciting and things like that and so it was it was scary and it that was one of the reasons why things like iyg were kept secret like their location wasn't dis disclosed for like years even though they were existing and creating the safe place for people because there was danger of you know being targeted I mean, we still see people being targeted today. It's better. It's not great. Um, but you you at least have some of that representation even now within um, within politics itself um, and things like that. And so there is some support there finally, which is nice. Uh, we certainly need more. <laughs> and more people to like run for those small offices and things like that to help create those changes because it does start in the in the lower places like school boards and stuff like that and that and that's how you kind of create the changes that have slowly come about um to create even more safe spaces i think it's just like how far we've come um even though you mentioned we still have a lot of struggles that happen these days but how even like the 1980s and also going back further than that how there were just like um there wasn't like a specifically like you know like an anti-gay like you know task force out there hunting down all these gay hotspots it was very much just like the attitude of law enforcement um of several politicians who were making it so that it was just very difficult to be who you are in the city of indianapolis and also throughout the state it um was. and it, it really was and that's and that's one of the great things now about like how far we have come is because now you don't you don't have that and not only do you not have that you have law enforcement and military in the parade you know you have actively open lgbtq folks serving on the police force you have them serving in the military you have them in these places where before they couldn't be or they they could be there but they couldn't be themselves they couldn't be out about it they couldn't share any of it that sort of thing because they would just they would be they were already having to target <laughs> and then they would become targets themselves um so with that kind of atmosphere and with everything else that was going on especially in like the 1980s in indiana um what was really the impetus that led to the decision to plan like um the first form of like an indie pride i know that indie pride wasn't the very first pride parade right or was there another organization that that organized one it was more a combination of all those smaller organizations that sort of came together and and um, created what was um, they didn't even call it pride. It was just like a celebration on the circle, and and that was one of the things that was spearheaded by by Justice Inc. and um by GIGBA uh those sorts of things those sorts of folks I mean there's there was definitely a lot of people think of um a, the, the the brunch the the infamous brunch that took place at the Essex uh house hotel that um was kind of seen as sort of like this one of the seeds some people see it as like kind of the first pride in a way um, others see it as as one of one of the many seeds that were 
planted that eventually became the Pride Festival itself. But definitely that celebration on the circle was really the, the impetus. So we've actually got some slides about celebration on the circle, but before we move too far forward, um, what do you mean by like the infamous brunch? There, it wasn't really known as being necessarily, this is gonna be a, a queer gathering. It, it was again, one of those things where it's folks who were definitely part of the LGBTQ committee or community. And it was a gathering for a brunch. And so you had, business leaders, you had um, people that were in all of these important positions kind of coming together and really creating that first atmosphere of gathering. That's, re that's really cool. Um, so um, the first celebration on the circle was 1988? Yes. Um, we've actually got like the, the brochure from the one from 1990. So um, I'm about to share oh, some slides. The, the 1990, that was the first one. I'm sorry. So that was the first one? Okay. Yes. So we go ahead and click on it. So, all right, that should be up. Um, yeah, and um, here we have uh, the cover of the brochure um, for Celebration on the Circle. And there you can see Monument, uh, monument Circle itself with the, uh, the war monument right in the middle. And then also, you, um, can you tell me more about the, the triangle symbol? I mean, I see it appear on a lot of um, LGBTQ plus like artwork and also in a lot of like, you know, advertising. The pink triangle is, um, it actually goes back all the way to the Holocaust because um, any of the prisoners that were found to be LGBTQ, they were, they were marked with a pink triangle that they were supposed to wear. And it was later on um, reclaimed as basically a symbol of pride. Uh, for a long time, a lot of people, you, you could see it on people's cars and things like that. And it would just be a pink triangle and be like, ooh, family. <laughs> when you see it, kind of kind of like people do think of a lot of times, it was, it was almost um, seen just as much a, a symbol of pride as the rainbow flag in a lot of ways. And it was used significantly during the AIDS epidemic. Uh, you would see it, the pink triangle against the, the black background for the silence equals death because of the AIDS epidemic. Well, it's a really powerful symbol, especially to have it against the backdrop of the downtown um, horizon with all of like the very recognizable Indianapolis landmarks. Um, so um, here's another slide. Um, it has the committee of the original organizers and also just the original uh, program for the day for June 30th. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Justice Inc. and the original organizers for Celebration on the Circle? They were... Um... They were an organization that did a lot of political work to try and help um, to try and help the LGBTQ community. Um, one of the things that that was really interesting in regards to the celebration on the circle itself was the fact that you know we we think of of the the parade now and stuff like that, and we block off the streets and do all of that, and you know there's there is a police presence there so that like this is where the parade's going to be. This is where the celebration's going to be. So we've blocked all this off and that kind of, we didn't have that. That just didn't exist because there was targeting. Um, in fact, at one point in time, the circle is fairly big. In anybody that hasn't ever been down there, it is fairly large. You can be on one side and something can be going on on the other side of the circle and you not know it. And at one point in time, um, the choir got up to sing and somebody just rushed right on up that was against this whole gathering and took over or tried to take over um, and spouting a lot of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and the choir just sang and drowned them completely out, which I think is just an amazing, just like it, 
it's an amazing example of of the term stronger together because here's one voice and it's like one voice is nothing when we gather together and and we I think it's it's incredible how, like you said, with the circle being as big as it is, um, and with what we can imagine of pride today, about how even though I'm only being like, um, like how many people would you say were at the original um, celebration on the circle? Um, the original one, trying to remember it. I can't, there was, I believe around like 3000 people. Oh, wow. It was, it was pretty large. Um, I, I think I might be thinking of the second one, the one that took place afterwards. Cause th there, it was, it went from being a smaller group and it just like exploded the following year. Um, much, I mean, honestly, much like uh, Greenwood Pride, this this year was their second year, and their first year it was fairly small and in basically a parking lot, and then the second year it just blew up, and there's just and Pride has kind of been that way the whole time. That, that's one of the reasons why it moved um, locations as well, like going from the Circle and then moving to across the street from the library to now military park because and even that seems like not quite enough space sometimes when you're there with with thousands upon thousands of people yeah and and military park's huge um, it is if anybody has ever been downtown and seen just like one end to the other um it's at least i'm probably gonna be wildly off here like two football fields not end to end but like side by side uh, which is a lot of space. Um, so yeah, so uh, Celebration on the Circle, um, it was, you know, one, one of the first like really large demonstrations in the city of just positive pride, not just like protests against the newly enacted law or protests against the treatment of the community, but it was one of them like a really positive step forward. Um, you mentioned earlier the Greater Indianapolis Gay Business Association. Um, yes. Who were they? Those were a lot of the... Um business owners that did identify as LGBTQ. And it it's one of those things where people that knew each other is like, oh, you've got a business and, you, and it's queer owned and you've got a business and it's queer owned and like, we'll get together. And then like, you start to pull in as your circle expands a little bit and like, oh, I know another one. Oh, and I know another one. And they just started to come together and and it's it's like a lot of things with the lgbtq community as a whole how most of these things do start to form is one person has an idea they've got a friend and they bring them in and then that person has a friend and they and they hear about somebody else and somebody else hears about this small group and then they want to join because they also have the same thoughts and ideas of um, <clears throat> wanting to create a better place for everybody. And so that's basically what these businesses did was they just sort of started to come together and support each other. And that's how you kind of got to know, like, I mean, you see it even now today still where it's like, hey, I want to buy this or I want to go to a restaurant, what's a good LGBTQ owned restaurant that I can go to and support? And so that's kind of what these businesses were doing for each other as well. That's really amazing. Um, so we have the um, Celebration on the Circle and we have the Greater Business or Greater Indianapolis Gay Business Association. Um, and so Celebration on the Circle happened for many years, but then, um, when does Indie Pride enter the picture? Indie Pride itself, um, was 1995. So it hasn't actually been around that long when you really think about it. Um, 
and it was established kind of just as an organization to manage the festival itself and the parade itself and that and that sort of thing um that that way it wasn't like here rather than a whole bunch of people trying to do it and then come together it was like okay we'll come together as any pride to then do it sort of thing it was it it was almost more like creating a committee in a sense um and they immediately held like their first like pride festival and parade in 95 um I believe so yes <laughs> i think they both ha I, I think they did both happen in 95 yes okay um can you tell me more about like their like the initial like like the committee um so it was made up of like the members from justice inc but who were like the any of the prominent members of that um within the original formation of indie pride um i actually don't have names on who like the original like core board of of any pride was um but it was pride itself it, it was kind of two different organizations because there was the word and there was justice inc and they hosted the traditional event that mm -hmm. was at university park in veterans plaza and um and that was created and all the funds went towards Justice Inc. to help support that. Um, and then Indy Pride kind of reorganized under the leadership of uh, Linda. Sorry, my kitty is winning attention. It's under Linda uh, Bachelor Bellow. Bellow? Bellow. Yeah, Bellow. And um, then they held the second event in the fall of 96 on Talbot Street. And then it was kind of between 96 and 99 that both the Pride events sort of coexisted and worked together. Um, and then Indy Pride basically paid back its debt while the word paid uh, for the June events and donated those profits towards Justice Inc. It, it was a whole lot of like, here, let's get this going back and forth support sort of thing to make it happen because everybody still wanted these things to happen. Um, but it wasn't until 97 that any pride itself became a tax exempt organization and it established its first office. And that was in Fountain Square. So we have Celebration of the Circle, which brought in um, um, about 3000 people. And then it seems like it grew really quickly um, by like, you know, like the, at least by the 2000s, how many people do you think attended either the parade or um, the, the pride festival? Um, in two, I know in 2002, 6,000 people attended the festival. And then in 2003, the attendance jumped to 10,000 people. Maybe so in one, in one year alone, it jumped. 4,000 people. Um, it's just, when we think, again, thinking of pride and just like the scope, I mean, it doubles in size in um, less than 10 years. That's really impressive. Yeah. Um, it really is. Um, and then um, for those who have never been to uh, pride, uh, I'm going to share uh, just some pictures that we have. This is from the 20 teens era um, of pride. Um, and here's just some people who are uh, just out. I mean, this is when it's in front of the uh, the war memorial, um, and you know, this is when I got all you see all the pride flags. Um, and here's also just a picture of the parade. Um, and the parade has just numerous floats, and a lot of groups come there. Um, and I, that's the current picture from Pet Pride of two very lovable pit bulls. Um, yeah, the parade itself. Um... It was really 2002 when the parade would feature a float and, and things like that. That's, that was really the first year that they introduced the parade itself as being part of 
pride. Um, and the whole thing only lasted like 15 minutes. The whole parade lasted 15 minutes. And now it's like, okay, we have to cut it. We have to get this done in like an hour. Like now we have to like limit the amount of space and time we take. Um, yes, yeah, so we've talked about the, the festival, um, but and uh, about the parade itself. Um, and so for our audience, um, can you just describe just, you know, what, if you had to describe the, uh, pr the Pride Parade to someone who's never seen it before, what might you see there? Oh, the Pride Parade. It's amazing because see, I'm not, I'm not originally from Indiana. And so I remember going to my first Pride Parade and it was just so incredible because you see a whole, the whole gambit across the entire community. You know, um, a lot of times people don't realize that part of the support that the LGBTQ community um, got and has had throughout the country um, has come from um, the BDSM community. So you see a lot of like the folks with the leather pride and, and things like that, they're a huge part of like the support, you know? And so you get to see all these pockets kind of like all the folks that kind of came together to help create pride in the first place you see all these bits and pieces throughout the entire gambit of the community that come together and so you get to see um you get to see the leather pride you get to see trans pride you get to see you know churches now and everything else like that which is amazing and i remember actually even seeing uh being there with my wife <clears throat> and seeing for the very first time military personnel in uniform marching in the parade and she was kicked out of the military for don't ask don't tell so to see kind of that that's one of the things that i think i love the most about the parade is you can actually see the progress that is happening within society itself. You see more churches, you see various religions, you know, it's not just one religion, it's like multiple religions. You, you see military personnel, you see, you know, emergency personnel, things like that. All these different, you, you see politicians and things like that. All of these aspects that used to not be able to be a part of it and share themselves sharing themselves and i think that that is actually what i love the most about the parade is just getting to see that and then the fact that it is a parade so everybody watching gets to celebrate that as it passes by that's really powerful especially when we when we started this program we talked about how um some of the persecution that people were experiencing and how it sounds like the parade really helps people get to like it's not just showing off who they are, but it sounds like they get to actually be there and be proud and um, all the positivity associated with that. Um, For sure. So um, there are a lot of floats. You mentioned having to cut it down from, um, you know, uh, um, to down to an hour. Um, <laughs> what kind of floats really stand out in your mind? I think that actually more than the floats, it's the people that just march. The people that gather together and go, you know what, our group, we want to celebrate us and show people that we're celebrating ourselves and things like that, you know, so I, I find those to be the, the, the floats are amazing. They are. I love the floats and the, and the music and the dancing on the floats and all, all that kind of stuff. But I honestly, I, I, my, my, my heart it's just so happy when I see the people that are just like, here's our banner. We finally have a banner this year, you know, and here's all our flags and that kind of thing. Whatever, whatever it's actually for it. I, I really, I love when it's those small groups that it's like, maybe this is their first time in the parade, or maybe it's their second year in the parade. And now, now they've got a banner and now they've got this or that kind of thing. I think those, 
those are my absolute favorite. Um, so for our audience, um, in about five minutes, we're going to be entering into the Q&A section of our program. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A section that's at the bottom of your screen, um, or uh, put them in the chat section, um, and we will answer them in just a few minutes. Um, but before we get into the Q&A section, um, so we talked about the challenges that uh, the LGBTQ plus community experienced in the 80s. Um, what do you think is the, like, the challenges that they're facing today? The challenges that they're facing today, um, well, we've seen it. We've seen it in the legislation. We've seen it in the anti-trans um, bills and things like that, that have not only been proposed, but passed within our own Indiana state legislature that discriminate against kids just wanting to play sports. Um, we've seen it in the targeted banning of books that, in, that are primarily, you know, BIPOC and LGBTQ. I mean, that's when, when you look at the list of those things, that's what's targeted. Um, and it's simple. And it's not even on subject matter a lot of times. It's just on the fact that based on the author being either LGBTQ or, or BIPOC. And so there's still a lot of, um, there's been a lot of push in that. And it's it's really kind of frightening with how, how quickly it's picked up in areas, um, especially the, the fact that they are targeting kids so much and that these kids are just being used as political pawns um and we've we've always kind of been the the low-hanging fruit you know it's it's easy to go it's easy to go after us and i i'm i'm it's discouraging to see how how far and how quickly it is spread throughout the whole entire country and not just our state um so we do still we do still have those but i think what's also really encouraging is that while like a lot of people they talk about um like how so many of the, the the gay bars and lesbian bars have like disappeared and stuff like that and where where we've almost kind of come full circle in a way in which previously the bars and, and restaurants and stuff like that, they were sought out if they were accepting, you know, kind of thing. And, but low key accepting where now we're kind of back to that, to where there's more of those places that are accepting, but it's not low key. They're blatantly accepting. And they welcome us with open arms. And many of us own those businesses and run those businesses and work in those businesses. And, and we hire from within the, our own community and things like that um, to create those spaces. And we fight for changes within those companies and businesses and things like that to create protection policies within, you know, HR and, and that sort of thing. So people can just be themselves at work and, you know, have better benefits. And so despite everything that might be going on around us and outside, trying to keep pushing us back down, I think that maybe some of why we see so much of it is because we've kind of stopped letting them push us back down. We're not so easy to push back down. They can pass the laws and things like that, and it might pass, but we're gonna fight it and we're gonna win. <laughs> and it really, it's, you see it actually at Pride and you see how the, especially culturally, um, like one, you see like how corporations have started to shift and I'm not saying that like you know corp like corporations change their logos, but some and and you know for some that's you know that's a big step, but for others you know it's just it's putting up a new letterhead during the month of June. But as of like 20 years ago, you wouldn't see companies like Coca-Cola or um, 
I'm trying to think of ones that seems to be, um, um, CBS and uh, their Paramount Plus app, where for the, the whole month, they've changed their logo to a Pride logo. And uh, you, you, it's just interesting seeing how companies have started to, I don't want to say em, like embrace um, the LGBTQ uh, community, but at the same time, um, they're starting to be a little more inclusive, whether it's from you know just more rainbow artwork or actually having a presence at Pride. Or even, you know, having, you know, what having queer characters on shows and things like that. And it's not just like, oh, and this person dies a lonely death, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. They, they either die, they're lonely, or they die lonely, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, they, they're having like loving relationships and, and, and those sorts of things. And we're seeing it more and more outside of June. And that's what I really love because mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's the ones where you just see it, where they throw it up during June and it's like, okay, time to cash in on the gay TM. And, <laughs> and, and then like July 1st hits and it's like, phew, down comes the flag back to everything else. You know, let, let's, let's count our money and see how much we've made where now you're seeing it though more where you're, you're seeing more, um, DEI work within these companies to create these spaces and create these policies and changes and not just within their own business but within their practices too with how they deal and interact and service their customers that are also LGBTQ. And it feels like also it's not just from the company's perspective we're also seeing uh, people from all age ranges where yeah. Um, I know when I was talking to a friend the other day, they said something about um, pride that always felt a little off to them was that they were um, a much older individual by the time they entered the, the community. And so for them, they weren't sure if they fit in with modern pride. But um, it seems like you get people from all walks of life and from all age ranges who now show up for both the, the parade and for the festival. It is. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love is that we do have both the older generation and the younger generation, the kids that are now feeling comfortable enough to be able to be out and to express themselves, as well as the older generation that can be there to kind of help mentor them and be there and guide them and um, maybe even help create some of those spaces for them. And honestly, what's also really neat to see is like when the younger generation isn't seeing those spaces being created for them, they create them themselves. They just, fine, you don't want us here, boom, we're gonna create our, create our own space, that kind of thing. And we're gonna make this work and we're gonna make it happen and that kind of thing. And that's the absolute amazing thing about, I mean, as much and as horrible as the internet and social media can be sometimes, it has been tremendous for the queer community. Because no matter where you are, you can find your people online. Mm -hmm. And and that helps them to then gather even in person eventually. Which, you know, yeah, and we, I know that the uh, the internet can sometimes be a very bad place, but it's, it's really helped out, especially with, you know, with um, organizing and with also letting people know that it's okay to show up to Pride. Um, so um, we're going to go into some of the questions we have. Again, if you have any questions, make, please put them in the Q&A section. It's at the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen. Um, so the first one that we have um, is from Karen. Um, uh, they're curious if there was ever any infighting in the LGBTQ plus community in Indiana, like between um, identifying groups. You know, there always is, honestly. And it's it's more it's not necessarily always the groups themselves. It tends to be, you know, the, the people that are the loudest <laughs> within those groups that then want to cause trouble for, for others or to not be inclusive or to not allow those spaces and things like that. I mean, <clears throat> to be quite frank, when you look at the history of Indie Pride itself, and you look at the board, it was predominantly white male. And as time has shifted, you know, I think that right now we have the most diverse board that Indie Pride has ever seen. 
you know, I'm not the only trans person on the board. That's a shock, you know, in itself. Um, we're not all white. <laughs> and we come across the entire LGBTQ spectrum. And you don't, you didn't really see that a lot then. And I think that that's part of the reason why we're working so well this year and we're doing so great this year and we're trying to make all of the things happen for as many people as possible and to be as inclusive as possible of everybody and to build those bridges is because there has been a lot of if not infighting but ostracizing or not making everybody feel like they're welcome in those spaces, even though it's like, oh, this is an LGBTQ event, there's still sometimes, you know, when folks show up and they're kind of given the side eye of like, why are they here? They're, they're, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And we're getting rid of that, you know. <laughs> it's just not, it's just not acceptable and we're not going to allow it. And so we're getting away with, it. we're getting rid of it. So there is, yes. And we just don't stand for it anymore, honestly. Well, that's great to hear. Um, we have another question. This is from uh, Caroline. Um, how can someone be a good ally throughout the year and not just at Pride? Um, well, by asking that question, that is the first step, honestly. Um, just by wanting to be, <clears throat> educate yourself. I would say that that is is key, you know, don't don't put it all on, you know, your your queer friends to for them to do the emotional labor, do the labor yourself. Like we were talking about, you know, there's so much information now out online and everything else like that in reliable sources. Um, at the library, <clears throat> you can learn about the different you know, sexualities and gender expressions and gender identities and all that kind of stuff. All of that is out there. You can educate yourself on that so that you're not relying on them. Um, be willing to accept the fact that you don't know what you don't know, you know, and you don't know what you don't know until you've learned. And um, be willing to admit your own ignorance. I certainly have my own in certain areas. And then you just try and educate yourself on that and to be supportive and just be there. That's how you can be an ally is just by, I mean, treating everybody as people. That's a good start. I think it's one of the most profound things I think that can be taken away from this is that you know, one of the things about being equal with another person is that they are the same as you. And um, just the fact that doing research um, and making sure that you're trying, like genuinely trying, I think that's that's really the important takeaway here. Um, it is. And, and you need to also recognize your privilege, maybe. I mean, I'm a trans woman, so I certainly have like things against me, but I'm not a trans woman of color. Who has it much worse? You know, I'm, I'm a trans woman who was able to transition at my job. Not everybody can do that. You know, those sorts of things. So just recognizing where those differences are. So like, you can even be a better ally if you're part of the community. You can be a better ally to your own community <laughs> just by recognizing those sorts of things. And and giving them space and giving them a voice and elevating them and involving them in conversations and things like that. Um, and not just <clears throat> and not just assuming that, oh, I know this about this particular thing. Everybody's journey is different. Um, so we've got um, only a few more minutes. Uh, if you wanna have any last minute questions, we've got another one from Karen. Um, so, um, I've heard recently a lot about rainbow washing, where as you said, they are cashing in on uh, the, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, is there a way to research a company and see just how LGBTQ plus friendly they are? Uh, there's a lot of different, 
information out there that you can go you can go through the ACLU, you can go through um, HRC. Uh, there's a there's a lot of folks that are keeping tabs on companies to see if they're doing the work, if they're actually doing the work, or if they're just like checking a box. Because a lot of people they do just want to check a box that way they wait they can kind of cash in. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, definitely the the information's out there. All you gotta do is is the research on um, on who's doing it. I mean that's one of the things that we made sure when folks were wanting to be part of the parade, you know, it is, are they wanting to be part of the parade to check a box? Or are they actually doing the work before they even, before June even shows up? And we made sure of that. I didn't make sure of that. Larry, who's in charge of the parade this year, it's doing a fantastic job of making sure of that. I think that's really great. Those are all really great questions. Um, we have time for just like one or two more. Um, this one is, um, what are you most looking forward to at this year's Pride? I'm actually, since I'm part of the board um, and a volunteer, I, I'm really excited about the putting it together aspect because I've never been a part of that. I've gotten to go and sort of work a booth and things like that. Um, but I'm really excited about, man, there's so many things I'm excited about for this year. I'm excited about getting to help put it together for my entire community. I mean, that's amazing to me. And honestly, anybody can help out if they wanna volunteer, they can just sign up and volunteer. Um, Cause there's so much that goes into it. There's so much work that goes into it leading up to it, the day of, and even the day after cleaning up. <laughs> There's a lot of work that goes into it, but I'm excited to kind of be a part of all of that and making it happen, especially after this long gap of not having it in person. Um, so that I just find absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm excited because I'm looking forward to the fact that I know so many people that this is their first pride. I know people that this is their first pride as themselves, you know, as their true selves. Um, I'm looking forward to just finally being back together as a community and especially being able to do it while all of this nonsense in legislation in Florida and Texas and Indiana and everything else like that is going on around us that we can still have a moment where we can celebrate ourselves and celebrate each other for being our true selves. Well, I think that's, it's, it sounds like it's gonna be a wonderful time. Um, just real quick, before I turn the mic back over to Bethany, um, where can we find out more information about Indie Pride? You can go to IndiePride.org. Uh, we are on social media as well. So you can uh, find us on Facebook, you can find us on Instagram, or on Twitter. Uh, you can find all the information on there. If you want to volunteer, you can go to the, the website and volunteer um, as well. Like I said, we need folks for setting up, cleaning up, breaking down, all that kind of fun stuff, cleaning up the day after, all of the different events. Um, if you want to help put on an event later on in the year, contact us. If you want to be part of the board, reach out because we can always use more voices from within the community across all ages and uh, experiences. All right, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic back over to Bethany and thank you, thank, for me, thanks again to all the people in our audience. It was wonderful having you here. Thank you so much. This has been such a thrill. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, both Kennedy and Jane. Jane, that was such a beautiful sentiment to end on about what you're looking forward to with pride that just warmed my heart. So thank you for that final sentiment. Uh, and thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. Um, if you enjoyed this program, I hope you'll consider coming back for more. History Happy Hours will continue next month with the history of the Masons and in August with the history of the written word.
We do have other virtual programs this month, including Equal a Work in Progress, where we will take a look at the interdisciplinary nature of Title IX and its legacy inequality today. And if in-person programming is more your speed, I hope you'll join us for Midwestern Roots in July. This multi-day event is perfect for the novice family historian and researcher alike. Or for the educators in your life, we have a series of five workshops around the state looking at teaching media literacy and empathy through primary sources. These are free workshops, so I hope you'll join us at a, at a location convenient to you. We will post this conversation to the IHS YouTube channel and our website in the coming weeks. In the meantime, if you'd like to revisit any of our free programs, including our conversation with the Indiana Youth Group, you can check out the History Happy Hour playlist on YouTube or at the link that Casey will drop in the chat for you. If you missed your chance to donate or would like to make a further gift to support the Indiana Historical Society and the preservation of stories like this, please visit the link that Casey will drop in. Your donation allows us to continue to share and preserve Indiana stories. At the close of the window, you're going to be prompted to take a one minute survey. Promise it doesn't take very long. We'd love to know what you thought and what other topics you may be interested in learning more about. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you as well to Jane for joining us and sharing your time with us tonight. I hope you all stay safe and healthy, and I can't wait to see you again virtually or in person in the future. Have a good night, everyone.